Just a couple things. The, the background for this is really from a book that's called Cooler Smarter. It's put out by the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I actually won this book. And so it kind of it won me over after I won the book. So I'm kind of giving you a lot of the little snippets from in there. One of the things to know about this is that I am framing this without any political or theological or any kind of aspects with regards to global warming and climate change. This is simply ideas for things that we can do to reduce our impact as it applies to um, carbon emissions. Let's see what we got here. This works. OK, basic agenda. I'm an engineer from General Motors, so we've got to have an agenda. Um, just kind of keep things on track here. We're going to have a little bit of trivia time to get things started. Going to do a little bit of CO2 facts. I'm going to talk about the goal. We have an overriding goal for the presentation give you some of the practical ste steps, and then we'll have a summary. So we're going to start with some, a little bit of trivia. I've broken this down into the categories that also match the presentation. So before I go into each of the little sections of the presentation, we'll have a couple trivia questions as well. Can you name as many as possible? There's five of them. How many of the five naturally occurring greenhouse gases can you name? Methane? CO2. CO2. CO. Well, maybe not really that CO, but another version. Let's see here. What else can you come up with? Ozone. That's O3, right? Nitrous oxide. And the fifth one is water vapor. You have to think about the importance of water vapor in our atmosphere. Um, if all Americans reduce their emissions by 20%, carbon emissions, over 1 billion tons of carbon dioxide would be prevented from entering the atmosphere. This is the equivalent of taking out how many average size coal burning power plants, taking them offline. A is 2, B is 20, C is 200. 200. 200 of the nation's 600 coal burning plants could be taken offline if we would all get together and reduce our emissions by 20%. The emissions of an average American are how many times greater than the global average? A, one and a half times, B, two times, C, four times. Four times. Four times. Four times. The average American's global warming emissions are four times the global average of per person and twice that many of the industrialized nations such as France and Japan. Here's a little bit of fun trivia here. Our nation's third largest city is implementing a plan to reduce its emissions to 25% below their 1990 levels by 2020. What is that city? Minneapolis. Chicago. How about that for a big goal? 18 of the 20th largest cities have made commitments to significantly reduce their global warming emissions. And then the last pre-trivia question here is, a retrofit to what iconic American building included replacing 6,500 windows and resulted in a 40% reduction in energy usage? Empire State Building. The retrofits made to the building save $4.4 million and avoid 105,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions a year. Okay. CO2 facts. On average, each American adds 21 tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere each year. Thinking about how much we weigh, looking at 21 tons a year of emissions just seems like quite a bit. It's four times the global average, as we just talked about, and two times the industrial Western European country average. What does a ton of carbon mean? I do want to start with just at least a definition so that we all are on the same page. Emissions, we're going to use 2,000 pounds ton. That's kind of basic. The most familiar unit for US people. Um, carbon emissions is us going to be used synonymously with carbon dioxide. And it refers to the actual measurement, which is carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2E. 
And um, this also, what this reflects is the other greenhouse gases, such as the methane and the nitrous oxide, have a value, and that has been weighted against the carbon dioxide and roll, all rolled in as if it's carbon dioxide. So if you are looking at a landfill that has methane, as its main emission, that gets converted into a carbon dioxide equivalent. And so when we're talking about carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, or carbon dioxide equivalents, we're all talking about the same sequence of numbers. Okay, our emissions come from five key areas in our lives, so this will make it kind of fun for us to be able to look at those different areas. Transportation, reflecting the largest one at 28%. Food at 14%. Home Heating and cooling, 17%. Other home energy use, 15%. And stuff you buy is at 26%. So we're going to take those areas one at a time. Our goal overall, which is the goal from the Union of Concerned Scientists, is to try to get ourselves to reduce our emissions by 20%. That's four tons. So if we can pull four tons off of what our average, spending, of our average emissions is, then if all Americans could do that, we would reduce the total by 1 billion tons a year, 200 coal plants, or 50% of the coal-generated emissions. I think that's a pretty fun goal to be able to consider. So the first steps in doing this is to determine your baseline. If you really don't know what you're putting out, it's very hard to think about how you'd be able to reduce that. So some ideas, make sure with your car you're saving your receipts writing down your mileage, calculating your mileage so you can tell the efficiency of your vehicle. With your home, gather you, your utility bills. I know you can do a lot of that online now. They do a lot of breakdowns um, with what your utility bills are, the electrical version, the natural gas version, any other alternative utility sources. Carbon footprint calculators can also help to take in some of the considerations from some of the other aspects of your life. And there's an example one there, cool climate at Berkeley. Um, is one of the um, carbon footprint calculators that they recommend. Okay, practical steps. Our goal is to give you some, my goal is to give you some ideas to reduce your carbon emissions and to help you save money. Um, I think this is very important. I know as an engineer, I work for General Motors, we don't do anything without making sure that money's part of the process. And I think it's very practical for us as we live to understand that, yes, there are some things we can do that would cost money, but it's really more important to us to see the value in what changes we make. So a lot of these will also save money. Okay, first category, driving down emissions. Emissions related to the car. Here's our, here's our trivia. Our energy, our energy systems are remarkably inefficient. On average, what percentage of a gallon of gasoline goes toward propelling the car or truck? Any guess? 25 to 30%. Any other guesses? 15 to 20%. So that really takes, makes us really think about how we use our vehicles. Um, it's just one of these things to, to think it about. Is, it is the Stop and go kind of problems. All of that, the inefficiencies of driving the vehicle itself, all of the other things that are going on, you've got a lot of friction involved, as well as even some of the inefficiencies in getting you the gasoline itself. So all of those are taken into consideration. In the United States, what mode of transportation racks up enough miles in one year to complete 14,000 round trip voyages to the sun and back? A air travel, B, cars and light trucks, C, passenger trains and subways. Cars and trucks, that's what we want to talk about, right? The United States racks up a mind-boggling 2.7 trillion miles annually from cars and light trucks. Consider the total emissions when the average car is driven 12,000 miles a year. It emits seven tons of CO2 in the atmosphere each year. So this is our perspective here. 12,000 miles, 20 miles per gallon, 7 tons of CO2. That's three and a half times the weight of the car itself. So that car is producing more emissions by weight than it weighs. Okay, 
The number one thing that you can do, this is kind of obvious, but this is the nature of the presentation. Some of these are very obvious. Some of them aren't so obvious. Some of them are easy. Some of them are not so easy. Switch to a car with better fuel economy. Upgrading from a 20 mile per gallon car to a 40 mile per gallon gar car can save you 2,400 gallons of gasoline over an eight year lifespan for a car. At today's gas prices, that's a savings of more than $9,600. Okay, now here I have two advertisements for today. The first one is since I work at General Motors, over at the General Motors plant on Lexington Avenue, there's about a thousand of us. We each have been given the opportunity to, to give one employee discount to a friend. So if you're looking at a car and you don't have a GM car or you have a non-GM car in your fleet and you'd like to look at a GM car, which would get better gas mileage, that would be my requirement, and you'd like a discount on it, let me know or hook up with one of those other thousand people that work there. That's good through the end of the month. Just That's a quick question. Um, are the carbon emissions similar uh, between diesels and gasoline cars, or is there a difference? The I didn't one? really look at the diesel. There is a discussion on diesel. Diesel, as you know, is becoming cleaner and cleaner and is actually a very respectable choice to make because of its mileage and, the, and its cleanliness. In Europe, they're used, uh, in Europe, they're used quite a bit, and they have considerably better gas mileage than um, U.S. cars. Now, that may be because emission standards aren't the same, uh, but just curious how those compare and, and whether there was any advantage to one or the other. Okay. Do I need to repeat the, just the voice in my head? Do I need to repeat the question or the comments? Okay. I just want to remind everybody that this is being recorded for TV. So um, if you could, when you ask a question, please make sure you have one of these microphones before you ask it. Okay. Thanks. And I was supposed to repeat the question. He asked about diesel emissions in case you know, anybody needs to know what that question was about. Okay. Think before you drive. So in the case that you're not ready to buy a car with... Just one sec. Uh, which, which of the GM model gives 40 miles to a gallon? Which of the GM models gives 40 miles to the gallon? There is some of the cruise levels. I mean, they're probably at the 38 range, the cruise, um, the Eco Cruise. I have a Chevy Volt, and it gets way more than 40 miles to the gallon, but... <laughs> But it's worth looking at. I mean, it's one of those things that's kind of relative. Um, but there are several that do get that range now. Not the big trucks, though. Um, so in this category here, these are things that are a little bit more achievable for everybody without buying a car, buying a new car. The idea of trip chaining. Take a look at what your errands are for the day. And rather than going out and coming home and going out and coming home and going out and coming home, Go ahead and pay attention to where you're going. Plan your route. Um, this is something that's done in logistics for big companies and something that we should also consider for ourselves. If it's less than three miles to run your errand, take a walk. Ride your bike. Um, I'm a big bike rider, and this is actually kind of fun to do sometimes. Just go ahead and put on a backpack or grab a bag and go and grab your groceries or whatever it is that you're doing. You can't do it for a lot of things, but when you have some of those local errands, um, make use of that. Share a car, share a ride. Um, it's kind of a little bit of an old-fashioned thing back when husband and wives both shared one car, but the efficiencies of doing that actually is fairly good if you can go ahead and make that work. Make sure that if you have somebody else going the same direction as you, think about sharing a ride with them. Um, the other option is to fill up with passengers. The idea of the carpool. And this kind of extrapolates, which this was an interesting one to, to show the diagram here, how that works because you're adding weight to the car by adding another passenger, which does make it less efficient. However, adding that weight is only about a 5% change in efficiency. So when you're doing that, what you're doing is you're taking something that would have been an entirely different vehicle and just reducing the efficiency of one car. And that's how it works for mass transit. So a bus, obviously, when you put all of those people on, you aren't increasing over and over again the amount of emissions, but you're actually just taking the one vehicle and making it slightly less, in, less efficient while removing all the other vehicles from the equation. So in this example, the car was the 229 um, units versus the 95 for a bus per person. 
So there is a definite impact to sharing a ride, filling up with passengers, or taking mass transit. Drive smarter. I think we talk, a lot of us know this, but we really don't pay attention to it. The importance of speeding up and slowing down gradually. Avoid jackrabbit starts, but the caveat to that is don't start too slowly. Um, I think on one of the other, I think I'll skip ahead and see if I can find it here. Or maybe I didn't put it in there. There is the discussion of, well, actually, I lost the whole slide. I'm, now that I'm looking at my presentation here, um, but I'll get to that one in a minute. I'll just do that one out loud. There is an efficiency that your car has, and if it's going too slow, it's not efficient. So you don't want to stay in that really low level for too long. You do want to get into that level efficiency. But you do want to not push step on the gas right away. So as you can see from the drawing, rapid acceleration uses more gasoline um, than the gradual acceleration. And the other one of this is the avoid hard braking. So the, in the, he told me, this is, there it is. This is the line of the gradual stop, which just shows the energy efficiency of it, as opposed to the peak here. This, this line here represents the miles per gallon used. So the higher this is, the more miles per gallon. So this gradual stop here definitely shows that it's using a lot less miles per gallon to do a gradual stop. The chart that's missing is the one that talks about how fast you drive overall. And that there is a sweet spot in the middle for the cars. And it really shows that if you go greater than 60, you're losing the efficiency of the car. So it is the most efficient at the 50 to 55 miles per hour. Um, and any five miles, for every five miles you go over that, you do lose that efficiency. <laughs> drive down the emissions. So the idea is to tune it up, regular oil changes, air filters, all of those type of things that you need to do to maintain your car do improve its efficiency, do minimize the emissions from the vehicle. Make sure that you empty it out. For every 100 pounds of extra weight, the fuel economy decreases by 1 to 2%. Um, so don't carry around a lot of extra stuff. Now, I know in the winter that's different. We're adding weight sometimes for a safety purpose. But in the summer, remember to take that weight out so that you can get that extra efficiency back. Check your tires regularly. This little plot here shows as the air pressure increases, the gas efficiency, that's this line, decreases. So or as the air pressure, I actually have that backwards here. As the air pressure decreases the efficiency, the miles per gallon went up so that they show that if you have a slightly flat tire, it will use more gas. That's basic friction. Um, that's the reason for that. Consider you buying low rolling resistance tires. Um, they do cost a little bit more, but that is something that you can do to reduce your friction, um, and you'll get the payback for it. Another idea or another thing that's kind of important to remember is don't idle your vehicles. It's actually been determined that letting an engine idle for more than a minute will use more gas than shutting it off and turning it back on. Okay, so that's the one thing. Drive-ins are a horrible thing for that purpose. You know, not only are they usually not faster, but they're extremely harmful in terms of the amount of emissions that we put out and the amount of gas we use. So if you're ever at a place where you have the choice of pulling in or going through the drive through pull in, go in. It's good to get out of the car once in a while. The other question that a lot of people ask is air conditioning or windows? And the studies have been done based on the efficiencies of air conditioning systems in cars compared to the friction generated from the windows is that it really doesn't matter. It's your personal preference. The difference between the two is so small that it's fine either way. Oh, can you show me? I'm going to say, I, I just recently put a, a sunroof in my vehicle. So can you comment on the drag on sunroofs? Yeah. Um, sunroofs or roof racks, any of those do add drag. So there is a reduction that would be, they do, one of the suggestions was taking off a roof rack if you don't need it. But I always think something like that's for an enjoyment, you know, and the amount of time that you're going to use it that you might as well go and enjoy it. Plus, you're probably changing some ventilation and doing it for some other reasons. Okay. 
Next category, holding the heat in the house. Each year, Americans waste a na nationwide total of $13 billion worth of energy from what? This is kind of easy since I'm in this category here. Home heating or cooling, idling cars or trucks, or vampire electronics. <laughs> so we're going to guess it's home heating and cooling, right? Because that's what category I'm in. One quarter of CO2 emissions from heating and cooling escape residential buildings through holes and cracks. What energy saving device can you use to save 15% more on your home heating and cooling costs? Except a thermostat. Yes, a programmable thermostat. Very good. No longer just for photo albums, old furniture, and ghosts. If every American household added this product to their attic, the nation could save more than $1.8 billion in annual energy costs. Insulation. Insulation. Very, you guys are on top of this. So here's our thing, annual use, U.S. household heating and cooling, 500 million tons of CO2, which equals emissions from 100 mid-sized coal-fired plants. Regional heating bills are often two-thirds of the total energy costs. Um, and that's actually regional as in countries with, or as in states with cold winters. So that's very reflective of where we are. Okay. The number one thing we can do is make your house more tight. Um, air leaks account for 20, 15 to 25 percent of the heat that our furnaces generate in the winter and that the homes, get, um, the homes gain in the summer. If you pay $1,100 a year to heat and cool your house, you might be wasting as much as $275 annually in leaks. Um, it's kind of a nice little graphic here that talks about where some of the holes are. Floors, walls, and ceilings represent 31%, ducts 15%, fireplace 14%, plumbing holes 13%, doors 11%, and windows 10%. And then there's the stuff coming out of the attic and electrical outlets. To help hold the heat in the house, here's the suggestions. Um, the first one is the one that I'm going to recommend that if everybody has, if they have not, is get a professional energy audit. Um, we sometimes are a little wary to do that. Um, but those people are trained in looking for areas that can improve your energy efficiency. In most cases, the energy audit is free. And because they want your business, they're going to come up with a very good list of valid concepts of things that you can do. Some of them easy, some of them that would make them some money. But none of them are you ever obligated to do. Um, and they also are a wealth of information. But within that, when you get an energy audit, probably the first thing that they're going to come up with is finding locations for you to add caulking, sealing, and weather stripping. Close off some of those leaks. This is extremely inexpensive to do, and the value in terms of reducing your energy leaks is very impressive. Adding insulation for attics, piping, and ductwork is an also one that usually has, has a very low payback. Chimney dampers, making sure that they're functional. Making sure that they're closed when they're supposed to be closed. If every household added insulation to the attics, we'd save $1.8 billion in energy costs and prevent 12 million tons of CO2. The best investment, as the little trivia quiz said, is the programmable thermostat. You can save 15% or more by adjusting your temperatures at night and when you're not there. Each degree down or up yields a savings, a 1% savings over a seven to eight hour period. So if you're gone for seven to eight hours and you move that thermostat up and down at the end of the month, you should have that percentage of savings that you could see on your bill. And just to make sure everybody knows, this was the part that I actually, as I was reading the book, I knew that the winter one, 68 degrees baseline, drop it down to 60 for sleeping and when, when you're not home, that one was kind of easy for me to understand. That would be approximately a 15% reduction. So I could cope with that one. But the summer one surprised me. The summer baseline is 78 degrees with 82 for sleeping and 85 when at work. So they're saying go ahead and make it warm. Um, we found that 78 was a little too warm this summer. 
But instead of doing the 74, which we would have, we were able to get to 76 and feel very comfortable with that. Um, and we were able to go ahead and let it go up when we were not there during the day. However, we discovered we like to be a little cooler at night than they thought we needed to be. So, but don't beat yourself up, you know, when you do that. I definitely still save some energy over what I'd done in previous summers. So I know that I had a positive impact, even though I didn't reach what the, the real goal is. Heat only what you use. Shut off rooms that you're not using and make use of space heaters or window air conditioners if you do want to heat those spaces at just a little bit of the time. Discussion here on fireplaces. Are they okay to use? They're not okay to use. So many of us have fireplaces and we like to use them. Um, the general belief is that a wood burning, wood burning by itself produces a higher CO2 emissions, but it's typic typically offset by source sustainability. Um, as long as you're not stripping a forest, you know, it's readily available and it's wood that's kind of at our availability. However, the traditional fireplace loses way more heat than it creates. Not only does it take the heat that it's generating with the wood, but it sucks out most of the heat that you put into the house from other sources. So if you would like to use your fireplace, it's very important to get a wood stove or gas stove insert, or at least get some tempered glass doors on the fireplace. Um, kind of a little sad to know that that idea isn't quite as efficient as we'd like it to be. Ideas, upgrades. Windows, single pane to double pane or triple pane glass with insulated frames have five to 10 year paybacks. I think that's good to know. They are an investment, but they do have a valid payback. Air conditioners, new models are 50% more efficient than models from as few as five years ago. So really pay attention to what your air conditioner says. Um, the energy guide will give you some guidance on that. Um, one of the other suggestions, though, is to go ahead and not use the air conditioner as much and go with ceiling fans or house exhaust fans to go ahead and move the air around without using the air conditioner. Other upgrades for heat, they went ahead and included the water heater in this category. It's responsible for 15% of the energy use and emissions within your house. The new ones are obviously more efficient than the old ones. Um, ideas are to consider the tankless option or the on-demand models if you need some hot water and you don't feel that you're getting it. Add insulation to older systems. That includes the piping as it goes up. Get some insulation to protect it so it's not actually losing the heat from the heater itself. Um, and maintain it at an ideal temperature of 120 degrees. So you can add a setback thermostat to your water heater. So if you're working, you can turn it off during the day and then turn it on like the hour before you get home. That's a and, very good and idea. And cut that cost. See, extra tips. I like this. Okay, furnace or boiler. Replace it if it's more than 20 years old. If it has a continuous burning pilot instead of electronic ignition or if it just isn't right. So if you have a furnace that isn't keeping you warm when you want to be warm, it's probably time to look at what's wrong with it. Um, there's a number here, the AFUE, Annual Fuel Utilization Efficiency, um, which will give you some guidance on picking a furnace. So if you go from a 65% AFUE to a 90%, you'll generate savings of $27 per $100 of your fuel bill. So that's something to really look at. Okay, home energy use. Just a couple questions here. Don't wash energy savings down the drain. Washing in hot water uses at least what, how many times more energy than a cold water wash? We got a guess of three. Any more? What'd you say? 25. 25 times more than a cold water wash? 25%. 25%, okay. It's actually five times. Five times more energy to wash in hot water than in cold water. Warm water uses approximately double the cold water one. 
Did you know that the typical American home is full of vampires? Consuming between 5 and 10 percent of the electricity generated in the United States, how many energy vampires or devices drawing power at all times does the average American family have plugged in? A is 15, B is 25, and C is 40. 40. The answer is 40. I tried to look, kind of look through my house and see. I mean, there's only three of us there. Um, but we're probably in the 30 range with three of us there. So I could see the typical family having that many. And I'll actually cover a slide on that. Energy, home energy use generates 15% of our overall emissions, approximately three tons per average American. Individual appliance energy efficiency is improving, but we're typically actually unaware of what we're spending or how much we're using. Knowledge is power. So one of the basic things I wanted to do was talk about sippers versus gulpers, because that's how a lot of times we pay attention to things. Um, and that's the, def that's the use of the word wattage. So if you have something like a hair dryer, we like our hair to get dry fast, that's a 1,000 watt hair dryer would be a good hair dryer, um, versus something, you know, we're used to a light bulb. We have 100 watt light bulbs, we have less than that. So that is how much it's drawing at an instantaneous level. So when you turn that hair dryer on, it's gulping. However, when you're doing, say, your cell phone charger, it's pulling at a very little amount. It's sipping. And we typically will let them sip all day long, and that's one of those things to be aware of. So the example to show that it is time dependent, um, a 1,000-watt hair dryer for one hour is, a, is equal to a 100-watt bulb for 10 hours. So they're both one kilowatt hour. And that's kind of what you, now you can tell what a kilowatt hour looks like. Not that you'd ever use your hair dryer for one hour, but let's say you drive your hair for 10, 15 minutes a day, you would use that quantity over the course of a week as opposed to the 10 hours of the light bulb. Okay, oops. A suggestion is to get an energy monitor. Um, this is a device that you can actually plug your utilities in or your appliances in so you can see how much they're using because that's one of the things that we don't use. They're fairly inexpensive from a local hardware store and often libraries, although I didn't check to see if ours has one, oftentimes libraries will actually have some that you can borrow. Maybe that's a suggestion we should give to ours if we don't have that. Check it out for a couple weeks. Source of, or one of the things that we do in our houses is we turn on light bulbs. Um, and hopefully we know that lighting is changing as we are right now. Lighting is the next highest use of electricity over the heating and cooling that we talked about. It represents 10 to 15 percent of the total. Incandescent bulbs are out. Not only are they being phased out, but they're extremely energy inefficient. Um, and so it's just important to understand that. 95% of the output from an incandescent bulb goes to heat instead of light, which is the source of their inefficiency. So the government is in the process of phasing them out. They're getting more and more difficult to purchase. So what's in? So in are compact fluorescents. They use up to 75% electricity. And LEDs, which use even less electricity per lumen of light, and are more and are also mercury free. And this is my second advertisement for the day. If you have not yet experimented with LED light bulbs, um, I'm part of the Penfield High School robotics team. And one of our fundraisers is to sell a 60 watt LED light bulb that looks like a regular light bulb. So if you're interested in doing that, we sell them for the same price as Home Depot, except that the profit goes to the team and not to Home Depot or a store like that. So that's my. I'm done with advertisements. OK, other things that we can do. I thought this was an interesting graph here. It shows where some of the um, largest energy use per year goes. Um, spas, pools, obviously, are down there as using a lot of energy. But the refrigerator is typically the thing that everybody has um, that uses the most energy in your house. OK. Once again, new ones are more efficient than old ones. 
So if you're ready for an upgrade, um, it's probably one of those things to go ahead and look at. Um, it can save, it can have a payback in as little as three years to go from an older refrigerator to a newer one. Um, this is my favorite quote of the presentation here. If it's avocado, it's not green. <laughs> Actually, our first house had avocado everything in it. So just remember, if it's one of those old-fashioned colors, it's probably not an energy-efficient refrigerator. New standards were implemented in 2003, which dramatically improved the efficiency of refrigerators. So actually, if you have a refrigerator that's purchased before 2003, its energy efficiency is much lower than the current ones. When you are buying your new refrigerator, make sure that you don't buy more capacity than you need. Um, that's one of those things that we seem to have a tendency to do is let's get the biggest as opposed to let's getting what we need. Fun features, use more energy. That's that ice maker. That's that little water thing in the front, the light that glows so that you can see the refrigerator in the night as you're walking by it. All of those things do use more energy. Um, and watch for rebates. If you are in the, in the shopping for a refrigerator, go ahead and make sure that you look for those opportunities. Other tips as far as your refrigerator goes, um, if you do have that old beer fridge that's down in the basement, go ahead and make sure that if you don't need to use it all year long, save it for those occasions when you need to, when you need to throw that extra turkey in it or that extra couple cases of beer because you're having a summer party. Uh, that's the time to turn it on, turn it off the rest of the time. For your regular refrigerator, clean the condenser coils. I think we always hear about that, vacuum that out. It does improve its efficiency. Check and clean the seals on the doors to make sure that it shuts and keep the doors closed. It's like a little thing. It's kind of like the other one that I forgot to mention is turn off the lights when you're not in the room. You know, keep the refrigerator door closed. Close the door of the house so you don't let the heat out. Some of those obvious things I think everybody knows about. Um, close washers and, and dryers. Close washers themselves are also more efficient now than they were many years ago. Um, they can use up to 37% energy and 50% less water, so you get savings in both places. High efficiency washers, actually one of the great features about them is that they spin harder so that your clothes come out drier, which does give you the opportunity to use less energy for drying. The interesting thing is that with dryers is there's actually not a lot of improvement in efficiency of dry dryers. So if you have an old dryer, it's fine. You might want to consider upgrading to a gas dryer, which would give you some efficiency, some more efficiency. But for the most part, a dryer is a dryer, which of course is why it would be good to consider other alternatives, um, such as hanging your clothes and that sort of thing. Washers and dryers, the, a discussion here for things to make them more efficiency, use cold water. Hot water uses five times more energy Warm water uses two times more energy. Um, and I know that this one's kind of amazing to me because I like to cheat and put that little bit of warm in there or add that little bit of hot every once in a while. So it is kind of striking to do that. There has been so much work done for the effectiveness of the laundry detergents to make sure that they cope with the cold water, that they really will clean our laundry in cold water. Um, rack or line your clothes when possible dry heavy items separately, and dry loads in succession. This was a real interesting one. When you have the dryer warmed up, use it. So if you're going to do some laundry, it kind of brings it back to doing the laundry day. Once the dryer's warmed up, keep putting, you know, go ahead and dry loads in succession as opposed to letting it cool down and having to warm it up again. Other appliances, dishwashers, we're kind of moving up the line a little bit here. Just the advice, use full loads. Scrape the, bish, scrape the dishes, but don't rinse them. And when you're cooking, consider a convection oven. Use the microwave for some small things when you need to reheat them. It's not necessarily more efficient than stovetop for large items. It's also, interestingly, not efficient, more efficient for boiling water. So if you're making your one cup of coffee or tea, go ahead and heat the tea kettle um, because it's not more efficient for that. Um, if you do have a stove, a gas stove that is still have, has a pilot on it, um, it you might want to consider getting an electronic um, ignition starter on that instead of the pilot just because that is more energy efficient. 
Okay, electronics. Kind of moving up the line here, the home computer section. The problem with our electronics is that we leave them run 24-7. Um, for the most part, a lot of them have those Energy Star labels on them, but they're really not designed or they're really not efficient when we're leaving them run all the time. TV energy use. I thought this one was interesting. Big screens use more electricity. That would seem like a, yeah, of course. But off is not off. 20 hours of off for a television is actually equal to four hours of on. So it's still pulling a lot of energy even when it's off. Um, and I think that's to give us that instant on impression. You know, we're, we don't want to wait for it. So it's one of those things that there are ways to go ahead and turn that completely off. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the, that in a second here. And then an idea with the big screen TV is if you are in the market for one, is to look for an LCD TV but has an LED backlighting and look for that energy star rating. Okay, shut them off really off was a suggestion for electronics. And that means getting a power strip plugging them into the power strip and turning the power strip off. So when you go to bed at night, actually flipping that switch or when you're not using those devices, do that. Now, of course, that means it's so that your little clock on the TV won't necessarily work, you know, and that sort of thing. And, but there are also power strips which are very uniquely designed so that they'll have an on section and an off section so that the things that you legitimately want to turn off completely can be turned off. But the things that you want to leave on, say you are trying to record a show at 2 a.m., that you can leave those sections on. So there are those type of power cords that do power strips that allow you to do that. And then the other thing is to go ahead and make sure that you've taken advantage of the sleep mode adjustments on your computers. If you do want to leave it on, um, turn off the screen savers. Screen savers actually use almost as much energy as running the screen itself. So while they're saving the screen in the sense that they aren't letting you freeze an image on the screen, they are not improving the energy efficiency of your computer if you're leaving the screen saver on. So go ahead and put it in sleep mode, or actually power saver mode is another choice that's sometimes used. OK, here's the vampires. Um, you recognize them because the little red light's on. You know, you'll see that. And I know that when you do, you plug your phone charger in, you know, that it stays on even when you've unplugged the phone. So, and that's just a little one. But 40% of American homes draw 500 watts or more at night. So that's the equivalent of leaving eight incandescent bulbs on all night long. So that's something really for us to think about. Um, one example was a laser printer, and I have one of these, and it's on right now. It's a horrible thing to think about. $100 a year for me to not turn that thing off at night or when I'm not using it. So I can tell you when I'm done this, this is going to be one of the changes that we'll be making is figure out how to get that one on a power strip so that one could get turned off. The comparison is a phone charger. If you leave it on all the time, will cost, 25, will cost you 25 cents a year. So when we're talking about sweating the big stuff, do we actually care that the phone charger is plugged in when I'm leaving the laser printer on? The answer is no. So we do have to do some of that idea of pick your battles. So some of these other things, because I think this is probably a little too hard for you to see, um, looking at it, the big one is the setup box. Digital cable with DVR is the large bar, about two down from the, or three down, three up from the bottom. The game console on ready mode is the very bottom line. Desktop computer is the second one down from the top, and a laptop computer is the third one down. CRT display is the other larger bar. So you can see there's some various things. They are all drawing some energy, though, at night or when you're not using them. OK. Just, um, one of the things grab, grab the mic. Thank you, Tony. One of the things I've done with my washer and dryer, I've, I've actually, on the washing machine, put a little cup hook next to where it's plugged in. And when I'm done using it, I unplug it and just sort of Obviously, with the dryer, it's a lot more difficult. You have to move the dryer because it's that bigger plug. But I unplug my washing machine. I hadn't really thought about those because I have such an old-fashioned washing machine. But a lot of the new ones do have things that are, are kind of on all the time as well. Okay. 
food. Have you ever thought about how much carbon emissions are associated with your plate of pasta? If you compare the carbon emissions, how many pounds of pasta could you eat before matching the emissions of just one pound of beef or pork? Six pounds, 11 pounds, or 18 pounds? 18. 18. We know to go for the big number here. These guys are pretty transparent, aren't they? One pound of beef or pork carries 18 times the emissions of one pound of pasta. Okay, while local farms that practice sustainable agriculture should be supported for many reasons, there's a common misconception around emissions from food. Which aspect of your food purchasing only contributes 4% of the total food emissions on average? Transportation from farm to supermarket, chemical pesticides and farm equipment, or electricity used on farm and for food processing? I heard an electricity back there. It's actually transportation. The trip from the farm to your supermarket only contributes about 4%, while production of the food accounts for 80% of the food-related emissions. If you and 19 of your friends, that's 20 in total, gave up drinking water, soda, and juices from plastic containers, the emissions avoided from the saved plastic would cut as much CO2 annually as a car would by driving almost half the distance of the equator or how many miles? 12,000 miles, 18,000 miles, or 25,000 miles? It's actually 12,000. The Earth's circumference is 24,000 something. So if you stop using water bottles or any of those type of things, you would save the equivalent of driving the car 12,000 miles. That's about an annual usage of, um, of a vehicle. Average use, most people do 12,000 miles. 14% of our total emissions are from food sources. Okay, so we're kind of getting, that's the littlest piece of the pie down there. And I'm going to do the little refresher on the carbon dioxide equivalent here, only because when we're talking about food emissions, we're talking mostly about methane. Um, so a little bit about nitrous oxide. Methane is 25% more of the effect than carbon dioxide. So that's when we're talking about the equivalent. Methane is actually a more potent gas in terms of the global warming concept. OK, eat a low carbon diet. This discussion part on figuring out the best way to plan your diet is a little bit complicated because of the various paths that food takes to get from being grown or raised into our table. Um, considerations are farm equipment fuel use, transportation fuel use, fuels used to produce fertilizers, pesticides, fuels used in food processing. There's a lot of sources of electricity and fuels that are used to get the food from where it starts to us. Um, so that does make it a little bit complicated. Um, but when they're going through and looking, and actually I'm going to go back to this one. This is a chart that just does show the global warming emissions by food type. Um, and you can see this first one here is the beef and pork. This is butter, chicken, fish, rice, fruit, vegetables, eggs, beans, dried beans, milk, sugar, bread, pasta, and flour. It's kind of a little scope there. So the two recommendations that are made, or food changes that we can make, one is bite the beef, eliminate some of the beef from our diets, by any measure, the production of meat, pork is included in that, especially beef, causes more emissions than almost any other food type. Okay, it's resource intensive, um, just because one of the examples is that um, the amount of grains that a cow needs to eat, as opposed to us eating those grains, is one of the things. It needs about eight pounds of grains for every pound of beef that gets used. So it's very resource intensive. Another example, though, was cheese. Um, the idea that 10 pounds of milk goes into one pound of cheese. So that also makes it a little bit interesting in terms of its resources that are used. So the suggestion is to eat less meat. The current average is 2.7, I'm sorry, 270 pounds a year of meat, which is four times the global average. We eat a lot of meat in America. Um, 
And if we were to go ahead and reduce that by 50%, uh, first thing that it would do is it give us a little bit more of a balanced diet. It would meet us a little bit closer to the recommendation that's currently out with the government's my plate drawing. Um, the second thing is that it would result in emission reduction of two tons, which is half a year of drawing, driving. So if all of us cut out about half of our meat consumption. consumption. Uh, so one of the suggestions, it's kind of hard if you are a meat eater um, to really think about doing that, but they gave a suggestion of picking one day a week, such as a meatless Monday or something like that. I actually have it fairly easy at our house because I have a daughter who's a vegetarian. And so in the course of her being a vegetarian, we as a household have actually learned to eat a lot less meat. You know, and when you kind of don't prepare it all the time, it just kind of makes sense not to have it there. Um, if you are going to eat beef, it is kind of, you do have an option here is to get some better beef. Grass-fed beef, if it's raised on properly managed pastures, can actually sequester amounts, significant amounts of carbon. So we'll actually provide a benefit. Um, and if they're end products of the, of the process, the biogas that can be used to generate some electricity. So there are some respectable ways to raise beef and the products from that. And so that is something to look at and to encourage. Other things that we need to do in terms of our food is to minimize food packaging and processing. Um, really look for unwrapped items. Really encourage that in our grocery stores. Um, we pretty much have to remember in grocery stores that we are the consumers, we are the customers. And if we make recommendations to grocery stores that they will listen to us. So it would be to pick things that are, are wrapped, um, kind of look for things that are wrapped for a reason, but if they aren't wrapped for any good value, ask them not to wrap them. Buy bigger unless you can't use it all. It is important not to waste the food, and I'll talk about that in a minute too. But the idea of single serving packages versus multiple serving packages, um, it is more efficient and more effective to get the larger sizes. Go ahead and use single servings as needed. Um, but not as a practice. And this is one of these things too, is, is we do have choices here and, and there's things that you don't, go, go, don't sweat that as well. So you know, if you're going camping and it'd be a lot easier to have some single serving things, go ahead and make that decision. If you're packing your kids lunch and it's a lot easier to throw something in that's prepackaged, go ahead and do that. But if you can get a reusable container and package it yourself, you will save money and you will make an impact on the, in the um, carbon emissions. And as always, select less processed foods. Um, everything, it seems like, is available to us today in a processed form. But it is possible to go ahead and pick things that are less processed, and they are healthier for us in the long run. Reduce food waste. This was kind of phenomenal to me. 25% of the food processed is wasted. And 60% of that is wasted by the consumer. So we waste a lot of food. We throw a lot of food away. We choose not to eat a lot of food that's been served to us. And we do a lot of things to do that. $165 billion worth of food waste enters the landfill each year. I mean, that's a lot of things. And there's a lot of people that are hungry. You know, so it's kind of one of those things that sets you back a little bit. What about restaurants? That includes our choices of what we choose. The 60% is what we don't eat at a restaurant. So say you go and get portions. Sometimes if it is uh, not used, they don't use it next day. They, it literally they have, goes. They, right. So, so things so at a restaurant, but there are waste. The 25% reflects restaurant waste at all. But of that 25% that's wasted, we personally waste 60% of it. So their waste is less than ours. So they might waste 20%, you know, as opposed to our 60%. There's, there's waste along the, all along the line, but a restaurant, we waste more than they waste. The amount of food that we leave on our plates or don't take home in a doggy bag, you know, that sort of thing is waste, way wasteful. Um, things to do, track your food use. You know, make sure that you're not buying something that nobody eats in your household. 
you know, kind of look at it and say, you know, what are we doing this for? Um, make creative use of leftovers. And then remember to share the bounty. Um, look for food recovery programs. If you raise stuff in your garden and you have too much, you know, don't let it go to waste. Find a neighbor, find a friend, you know, share the food. If it's a way for you to buy things in larger quantities and then be able to split it with somebody to make it more efficient, then go ahead and do that. There are a lot of food recovery programs going on. I know that we have Food Link in town, um, which definitely has a lot of value to our area. And they do get supplied food from a large number of restaurants and grocery stores um, that is used to feed other people. In terms of food waste, the most efficient thing we can do with the non-meat waste is to compost. Uh, for every ton of food that's composted, it saves close to a ton of CO2 emissions. So it is kind of a one-for-one -one ratio there. Applying compost to the soil also results in a net storage of carbon. So it does add a benefit on top of it to go ahead and compost. Composting is fairly easy. So if that's something that you haven't had an opportunity to try, I mean, I, I recommend that as well. A couple topics that everybody likes to be able to talk about. One of them is organic food. Um, in terms of carbon emissions, the verdict is out on that. There is such a difference between the impact of using the last, less pesticides and fertilizers versus the output of food versus the amount of land that's needed and all of those type of things. So that from a carbon impact, it's pretty much a wash at this point in time. And then how about locally grown? I love locally grown. I love being able to promote that. But from a carbon emission perspective, because it's only a 4% impact in terms of transportation, um, there's not a real good driver for it from the carbon emission perspective. OK, break the bottle habit. 1.3 million tons of plastic is used in the United States just to make water bottles. That's 50 million barrels of oil. 75% of those still end up in the landfill. Um, I think that's a pretty amazing statistic here. So just remember, you know, as you have things going on, I, the little graphic to the side here, you know, it decreases your carbon footprint. It's a smart thing to do. Production generates, in addition to the, amount, the water bottles themselves, 20 million tons of CO2, and that doesn't include the transportation of those bottles. When we add it to soda and sports drinks, bottled water accounts for 7% of food-related emissions. Um, discussion on whether or not that's safer to drink bottled water versus tap water. And in most cases, unless you're in a specific location with a specific environmental hazard, the answer is no especially since the controls on the plastic of the bottle is not as tight as the controls of the tap water that's, being, that's in our systems. OK, the last category is the stuff. A couple of questions. This corporation wants you to save money to live better, but maybe they should start saving energy to live better. One of the largest corporations in the world is also the largest consumer of electricity in the United States. What corporation is this? Did you say it? Walmart. Walmart. Although they recently pledged to make 22 million tons worth of reductions in their global warming emissions by 2015, that's the equivalent of taking 4 million cars off the road. The standard paperback book is responsible for 5.5 pounds of CO2 emissions in its manufacture and transportation to a bookstore. Considering the emissions created by the production of an e-reader, how many books would you need to download to your e-reader before you start lowering your carbon footprint? A is 1 to 15, B is 20 to 40, and C is 50 to 60. It's actually 20 to 40, B. It turns out that it isn't worth our time worrying about the carbon footprint of the way we read. That 5.5 pounds of CO2 emissions per paperback book is less than the CO2 emissions we emit when making the six mile round trip to the bookstore. Yep. 
Okay. So this takes up the last quarter of our emissions is the stuff. Unfortunately, we can't have a lot of impact on some of the categories of the areas of stuff, products and services, um, such as medical, healthcare and medicine. Um, it's not one of those things that we look at when we pick a doctor is whether or not he's being energy efficient when we look at the hospital. Um, fortunately, I think a lot of those places are starting to look at their impacts and emissions on their own, mostly because of the cost benefit. Um, however, we can still make a measurable reduction in tangible non-food that accounts for 10% or two tons of our annual average. Um, things like clothing and furniture and other things that we do get, that we buy. So, first recommendation is buy less stuff. Borrow rather than buy. Go with durables rather than disposables. I mean, the idea of using a dish towel versus paper towels, I mean, can have a big impact on your family in terms of your emissions and the other waste that you're getting rid of. Go for experiences instead of gadgets. Um, that's my family skiing. That's not my family. That's the representation of the skiing family there. Just pick things that will provide memories rather than buy the toys that will be used for a little bit and then tossed away. Reuse and repurpose as much as possible. Make smart choices. Select products that have higher resource or energy efficiency than the one you're replacing. So the example here is pick a rake instead of the leaf blower. That seems like heresy to me. I don't know, you know. I have to take away one of those toys. But in terms of making a difference with our carbon impact, it's better sometimes to go ahead and use our energy versus the electrical energy to do something else. Buy items that are well made and that have a long life. Select companies with a history of trying to reduce their environmental impacts and buy used and refurbished items. And then the reminder here, don't sweat the small, the small stuff. And that was the discussion of e-books versus real books. Read the way you want to because it's really not going to have a huge difference. Recycle. Recycling has a fairly substantial impact on the carbon emissions. First of all, it removes the need for virgin materials to be reused and the emissions generated from making or extracting them. It reduces the emissions from waste disposal at the other end. Um, and then the example here, aluminum has the best recyclability. Um, it's really fairly phenomenal how little additional energy is used to recycle aluminum as compared to actually producing new aluminum. More than 50%, this is a good statistic, more than 50% of cardboard and paper is recycled in the U.S. But the incentive needs to be now is that we need to make that decision to buy recycled paper products because the market is not there and they reach a wall where they can't accept any more recycled materials because they don't have a market for it. So while we're trying to recycle it, we need to make sure that we're taking the advantage and buying the recycled materials at the other end. Water and sewage. First, when I, when I was looking at this, I thought this was kind of interesting. I hadn't really thought about the impact of getting our water and sewer lines and how that would have an impact on our carbon emissions, except that the electricity used to move the water represents greater than 2% of the household emissions. So it produces 8.2 tons, 8.2 pounds of CO2 per dollar of spent for water. So the goal would be to use less water, it reduces our carbon impact, and it saves us money. Construction and remodeling. New home construction and remodeling accounts for 4.4% of the carbon emissions. Wood construction has a smaller impact than steel or concrete. So the concept here is to build no more house than you need. Design and invest in energy efficiency. A lot of times when we're working on building a new home, we're so concerned with the costs. And if we would go ahead and pay attention to making that smaller investment in some energy efficiency versus cutting that cost right, we would have the payback in the future. And seek out green techniques. 
And this is my final section of improvements that we can make, and that's in the yard and garden. So our yards are very carbon intrinsic activity. You know, we want them to be green and lush and spacious, and so there's the impact from pesticides and fertilizers. There's the impact from regular mowing. Once we've added those pesticides and fertilizers, um, then the grass grows and we have to cut it. Typically, we cut it with gasoline mowers. And then the other impact is that it becomes a monoculture, which is really what we want. We want that one grass in there. We don't want the other grasses. We don't want the flowers. We want that one space to have that little monoculture, which does affect the biodiversity of the rest of the area. So the goal is to have a low carbon lawn, seek out native plantings, native grasses, which don't need the pesticides and don't need the herbicides to grow, get an electric or push mower to reduce the gasoline usage, emphasize the composting. Go ahead and self-compost on the lawn or add the compost in to add the nutrients back. Encourage the biodiversity and to plant trees or shrubs, which will actually sequester some of the carbon. The final point is to spread the word. This is the, the goal, 20% reduction by all Americans would pull out 1 billion tons, would reduce the need for 200 coal plants or 50% of the coal generated emissions. And I found this real neat graphic here that talks about some of the statistics that we have. Um, when you cut your emissions by 20%, this is the one in the middle here, you would save more CO2 than turning off all the electricity for one year at your house. A programmable thermostat can result in $165 a year of savings on average. Trading in your SUV for a hybrid would save about as much CO2 as planting a football tree, football field with trees. If a family of four eats half as much meat, they avoid as, C as much CO2 as not driving their car for six months. When 20 family, friends, or members cut their emissions by 20%, it's conserving 6,500 gallons of gas equivalent. If 20 friends stop drinking bottled water, we'd avoid as much CO2 as a car would riding halfway to the equator. If 20 per friends purchased, reduced the amount of stuff they purchased by 20%, it's the same as two of them not driving for six months. If the residents of a small city reduce their emissions by 20%, that's like planting enough trees to cover Las Vegas. If each house in a small city traded incandescent bulbs for LED bulbs, they would be like turning off the electricity to 6,000 houses. If air leaks were caulked and sealed in every home in a small city, it is cut as much CO2 as conserving 1.6 million gallons of gas a year. When the small city of Boulder, Colorado established a program to leave cars home one day a week, it avoided as much CO2 annually than a car would emit driving to the moon and back. If everyone in the U.S. reduces emissions by 20%, that's shutting down 200 mid-sized coal plants, one-third of the emissions of the nation's total. And if everyone in the U.S. improved their home's efficiency by 10%, it would cut as much CO2 as taking 25 million cars off the road. If all American households properly used programmable thermostats, we'd save more CO2 than the amount produced by the energy used in 4 million homes in the city of Los Angeles. So those are some amazing statistics, things that we can do by little changes that we can make. So I hope that in the course of the presentation, you found at least 10 things that you can go and do or 10 changes that you can make. Thank you.